world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is April 8th, 2014, the Tuesday edition of DTRH. Welcome back to the beginning of a new week, ladies and gentlemen. Got a slammed week for you all. If everything goes as planned, I have guests lined up all week. Tonight, joining me at 10.30 at the bottom of the hour, or the, you know, the bottom of the hour, um, the half hour mark, I will be bringing in Stephanie Sledge. She's the investigative journalist, author, and webmaster who runs her own website. I've had her on before. If you don't know who she is, The Government Rag is the name of her website. Investigative journalist always does awesome, awesome work. She doesn't just write an article willy-nilly. She actually does research, ladies and gentlemen, provides links. I know, novel concept, right? Anyway, she's going to be joining me at 1030. Good friend of the broadcast. She hasn't been on a while, so excited to get her back on. She's written a couple new articles that we're going to go over and a few other things. Friday, I'm excited. My good friend Mark Passio should be coming on. So that's going to be a good broadcast. Mark and I haven't gotten a chance to broadcast live in a while. And uh, there's just a ton of stuff to go over. So I look forward to that. Thursday is Steve Stars. And yes, because it's that time of the year, ladies and gentlemen, we will be getting into the Titanic conspiracy and a few other things. Uh, We'll probably end up spending most of the time on the Titanic conspiracy again. And uh, I will be going over a few things. We do this every year. Uh, for, so for the newer listeners who have never heard of the Titanic conspiracy or have not heard my archives of the previous shows, we'll be going over that and a few other things. And then tomorrow, author Thomas Ryan will be joining me. Looking forward to that. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I'll have Thomas correct me um, tomorrow, but uh, if I remember correctly, I think he's going to be giving away a few copies of his books to you on air. I think we have three copies to give away. So that's going to be exciting as well. So I've got a, a, a packed week. And then um, if all goes well this weekend, I'll be traveling to Tampa for the day to actually interview in person Rene Petro with Luke Rodowski. Um He happens to be down here in Miami. And uh, I uh, he's working on a few projects down here for a couple of days. And I happen to work it out so that hopefully we get a chance to go up and interview her this weekend, get her some more attention, get Yes on 2 and Medical Cannabis more attention, the Cannamoms more attention. So I said on air that I was going to be pushing as hard as I could to try to get her story out and Sierra's story and the rest of the Cannamoms story out to as many people as I can. So I am doing just 
that. Renee told me she's going to be interviewed by uh, Joe Rogan, too, for his podcast. So that's good. People are paying attention to this. And I heard on the news today, mainstream AM talk radio down here in Florida, very conservative, I may add. And um, they were actually talking about the, the positives of medical cannabis down here and the amount of tax dollars that they think, you know, they project it'll bring in. And it's somewhere they were talking somewhere close to a billion dollars in tax revenue for the state. So, I mean, I, I don't know how much they're you know what percentage they're going to tax medical cannabis down here. So, we'll have to say I have to I have to be able to get a copy of the bill I guess as a whole and be able to read it if there's a even an open copy out there. I'm sure there is though somewhere. I have to see maybe I can hook up with United for Care. That's the people that are pushing down here for. Uh, the the legalization that's one of the organizations maybe I can get uh, a hold of them but uh, it's exciting news because the mainstream is talking about it and they're not vilifying it they're actually talking about it in full honesty I mean they're not talking about how it could cure cancer and all this other stuff but they're talking about the tax benefits of it which is interesting because that means that that's a talking point that, that was given to them by somebody now I wonder who financed that talking point does bring up a good interesting side note about this whole thing. Why is George Soros so interested in cannabis legalization? Now, some people have said, well, could be the money because Soros follows the money. True, could be. But these New World Order types, these agenda types, they never benefit in one way. So it really makes me wonder why Soros, is, I'm, you know, I'm sure he's making money off it, but there's got to be other, there's got to be other incentives. But I'm sure investing in companies and, and things now ahead of the game. That way when, if common sense prevails and the law gets passed, people vote yes on two down here and we get medical cannabis here in the Sunshine State, he would be uh, he would be making a lot of money. He would stand to benefit. So would anybody else getting involved in it. So, I mean, who knows? But I don't trust Soros. He's a dirtbag. And uh, I, I have no use for him. And I just wonder why he's getting involved in this. That's all. I really question his motives. I don't like the guy. He's dirty. Just saying. Anyway, I don't want to waste my time bashing him. People just need to look into that. People need to take that into uh, into consideration in their heads about him, about his involvement, but not about voting yes on two. Vote yes on two. Legalize medical cannabis. That's the first step down here in the Sunshine State. Think of all the job possibilities. All the dispensaries, the state revenue that could be made. And the cops will stop being forced to arrest people for stupid crimes. I mean, I, I know a lot of police down here that don't arrest people for cannabis because it's a waste of their time because they actually do realize that they have other things to do. Although there are the cops that will take advantage of it because it's an easy arrest. So you have a cop that's really not motivated. He just wants to get his check. He's kind of lazy. Easy pickings, low-hanging fruit. They go for it. Well, let's take that low-hanging fruit away from them. It's stupid that this is illegal. No reason it should be illegal. Ignorance. Big pharma. And there are still people out there, the state attorney, we're going to fight it. We're still going to push against this. Of course you are, until it gets passed, and then you're going to ask for a chunk of the tax revenue from it, aren't you? Right. Well, we can we have some of that money because we could use it to hire more attorneys or we could use it to hire more police officers and buy more cop cars and tanks and guns. I bet you all the naysayers against it out there, all the law enforcement types that might be against it, there's a lot for it, but there are a lot against it too. I bet you all those out there that are against it, I bet you, let's say it passes. We'll not say if, we'll say it's going to pass, right? So it'll it passes in November and it becomes law. I'll bet you as soon as that, that first chunk of you know billion dollar tax revenue comes in after the first year, I bet you you'll be one of the first people lined up with your hand out. We need to buy a new tank. I need to buy new uniforms. Ridiculous. Absolutely and utterly ridiculous. People need to see what's going on. Really quick. Let me see how much time I have left here. I got about uh, good. I got enough time here. I want to play a audio clip before I bring Stephanie on. 
And I got to get everything ready to get, bring her up because she's coming up in a few minutes. It's only about 15 minutes for the break. First segment goes by so fast. I want to play this audio clip of uh, a video I shot the other day. I've been doing these videos again. I used to do this a long time ago where I used screen capture software and I, I went over an article or a video, a new piece of news or information, and I broke it down. And I put it up in like five or ten minute length videos on YouTube. I used to do this a long time ago, but with the radio show and everything else, you get sidetracked. So I started doing it again. Anyway, I'm going to play the audio from one of these. It's about a student in New Jersey. A student in New Jersey receiving five hours of psychiatric testing and physical uh, blood draws. Obviously, they were checking for dun, 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 drugs, I'm sure. All because he was twirling a pencil, and the student behind him said, he's twirling it like a gun. So because there's zero tolerance policies, and they say, well, any student that feels threatened, we have to take action and investigate. Never mind the fact that the kid had a prior record with this student already, and that they were arguing uh, earlier in the day, and that this kid was apparently bullying. Uh, not the kid that was twirling the pencil. The other kid that screamed out was bullying the kid with the pencil earlier in the day, and then now this was or they were arguing or whatnot, and now this was almost like a retaliation thing. Kids do that. Anyway, you'll hear me go over that in the video. I want to play this little chunk of audio for you really quick. New Jersey student receives five hours psychiatric testing for twirling a pencil. Here we go. New Jersey student receives five hours of psychiatric testing for twirling pencil like a gun. Apparently, school officials in Sussex County, New Jersey have lost their minds completely. A boy was suspended from school and forced to undergo psychiatric therapy and what looks like blood draw and a physical examination in order to be allowed to go back to school because a fellow student said he was twirling his pencil, quote, like a gun. Now, I don't know if it's even possible to twirl a number two pencil like a gun, considering a pencil is shaped more like a javelin than anything else. I could see maybe if you had your hand in the shape of a gun and you were holding the pencil on top of it, but that's not actually the action of twirling. That is the action of holding the pencil like a gun. Anyway, I digress. The point is, this is just another example of what happens when you have fear-based ignorance about guns uh, mixed with the Sandy Hook official narrative, mixed in with zero tolerance policies at school. And this is the end result. Stupidity. Let's go to the videotape, shall we? A North Jersey teen says he was just twirling a pencil. His school says he was pointing it like a gun, so they suspended him. Was he a real threat, or did the school go too far? News 12 New Jersey's Douglas Clark has more from Sussex County. Seventh grader Ethan Chaplin has been home from his school in Vernon for two days after getting in trouble in math class. He says he was just twirling a pencil with a pen cap on it. I was just holding it like this, or like twisting it around. The student behind him yelled out, he's making gun motions send him to juvie. Ethan says the other student had bullied him earlier in the day and was now trying to retaliate, but the school told Ethan he was suspended pending the outcome of a psychological evaluation. I'm livid. I'm absolutely livid. I think it's gross misconduct at its finest. I mean, they took something so minimal and took it so far over the edge. We spoke with the superintendent by phone. He says school policy and the law mandates he investigate whenever anyone in a school feels threatened or uncomfortable with the actions of another student. We never know what's percolating in the mind of children, okay? And when they, when they demonstrate behaviors that raise red flags, we must do our duty. During what? Demonstrate behavior? That raises red flags. It's not like the kid went on Facebook and said, tomorrow I'm going to school with a gun and I'm going to murder my classmates. He was holding a frigging pencil, twirling it in his fingers. And apparently the kid behind him who had a beef with him screamed out, oh my God, he's holding the pencil like a gun or twirling the pencil like a gun. Send him to juvie. Do, you, do we see how easy 
it is for zero tolerance retardation to be abused by adolescent children whose brains aren't even fully developed and can't even understand the consequent the consequences of what their actions may be on this kid and his future and his record and his family can't really comprehend their full actions but you're just gonna take this kid's word for it they didn't even give the kid a chance to respond they just suspend him and then make him undergo psychiatric and physical evaluations Welcome to America with a K, ladies and gentlemen, the USSA, where we have a sickle and hammer and a swastika on our flag next to each other rather than the American flag. Just those two symbols superimposed over top of what the American flag used to represent. Absolutely ridiculous. Let's finish the video. Stupid superintendent. This is why I moved out of New Jersey, Sussex County, New Jersey. It's not far from where I grew up. Idiots. Questioning Ethan says administrators did not listen to his side of the story. I was shocked because I'm like, how am I not going to come back to school for it? I didn't even do anything. Ethan underwent a five-hour physical and psychological evaluation, which came back clean. He's now waiting on word about when he can return to school. In Vernon, Douglas Clark, News 12, New Jersey. Uh, all for a pencil with a pen cap on the back of it. A pencil. With a pen cap, probably the pen cap, somebody, somebody would say, well, why does he have a pen cap on the pencil? He probably had it on the front to protect the tip from getting broken off when he put it in his backpack. That's actually a smart idea. And since he was writing with it, he probably had the cap on the back, much like you would do with a pen when you were writing with it. Because, oh, I don't know, pens and pencils are writing instruments, and the kid was in school, in a classroom. See, the teacher right away should have said, were you twirling the, the pencil like a gun? And then the kid could have said no. And then he, he could have said, look, is there going to be a problem here? We have a class to teach. Let's move on. But no, no, no. The student behind him said the magic word, gun. So all of a sudden, full retard mode has to go get set in. And now once you go full retard, well, you can't go back after that. And you see what you have here. That's full retard, ladies and gentlemen. That is the school officials going full retard. You never go full retard, okay? Ever. These policies are stupid. Zero tolerance does not work. Okay, a kid being thrown out. This is just like the, the kid with the Pop-Tart. He was chewing a Pop-Tart in the shape of a mountain. The teacher perceived it to be a gun and the kid got in trouble. Didn't matter that that's not what the kid was doing. Because the teacher perceived it that way, well, you got to get punished. And this stupid superintendent, well, you never know what ideas are percolating in the mind of a child. Really, dude? You need to be retired. First of all, the guy looks to be in his 70s, uh, and he probably is in his 70s, and he, sound like, he sounds like he's in his late 60s, early 70s. Time to retire him and get somebody a little younger with maybe a little bit more common sense. And I'm not making fun of old people, but apparently this guy, maybe, maybe he's getting a little up there and maybe he's uh, you know, losing it. I don't know. Not using his common sense, if he had any to begin with. Maybe that's why he's an educator and he's so high up in the system that's so corrupt, because he doesn't have common sense. And he does stupid things like this and follows retarded rules like zero tolerance policies. It's like one size fits all. When was the last time you bought a pair of one size fits all gloves and they actually fit you? No. They're usually made for like huge people, and if you have medium to smaller hands, they don't fit, right? How many times have you seen somebody trying to wear a pair of one-size-fits-all gloves or a shirt or maybe a jumpsuit or something or a pair of pants or shorts or even socks? doesn't happen. doesn't work. One-size-fits-all does not work, okay? You'd think we would have learned this by now. But here in the USSA, police state of America with a K, common sense is thrown out the window. Anybody in New Jersey, anybody in Sussex County, in Vernon, New Jersey, if you have your kids in that school, you need to maybe really rethink about having your kids in public school and perhaps homeschool your children, ladies and gentlemen. Homeschool your children because I know you won't suspend your old child for twirling a pencil in class. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Check me out on Twitter. Two accounts, at Federal Jack. And the other account is at DTRH underscore Popeye. So at Federal Jack, that's the federaljack.com Twitter, 
and the Twitter for Down the Rabbit Hole with Popeye. That's me and my radio show at DTRH underscore Popeye. At DTRH underscore Popeye. Check me out on Facebook, Fed Jack. And check out my website with all my radio show archives, federaljack.com. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We have to stand up to this idiocy. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Remember, as I tell you, the solutions to our problems are an inside job. I am out of here. Talk about complete and utter idiocy, right? Just total stupidity. There's no common sense whatsoever by any of these educators up there. But then... I really don't expect any common sense from anybody in any position of authority in the state of New Jersey. Maybe that's a dig at the state. All you uh, New Jerseyans up there, Jersey people, don't get all pissed off at me. Oh, some guy in Florida making fun of New Jersey. I was born and raised there. I'm a Jersey boy. Okay, let me tell you something. There's a reason I left. When I was a kid in school, I thought I had a bad... This poor kid? I mean, technically... When I was a kid, the stuff that I got in trouble for, I mean, nowadays, the things that we got away with and stuff, I, I only, I would probably have been locked up by the third or fourth time that we got in trouble. Probably the first. I mean, the things that we did were like 10 times worse than this. I mean, kids actually used to flush cherry bombs and stuff down the toilet when I was a kid. I wouldn't know anything about that. I mean, I never did anything like that. <clears throat> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Kids were really bad when I was a kid. Kids actually did bad things. And they, they got you know, yelled at. The teacher told them to knock it off. I mean, maybe if they got in trouble, if you, know, you broke a window or you did something stupid that caused a window to break or a door to break, you know, perhaps you know, crack a door in half somehow because you were doing something stupid with your buddies. You know, you, your parents would get a phone call for that. Again, I, I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, but you just, I don't know. I, I mean, the... We, my friend and I broke two doors accidentally. Long story. But the point is we broke two doors, like completely in half. And my mother gave me a check to bring the school to pay for the damage after I got my ass whooped. And the vice principal was retiring the next year. And he's like, yeah, you know what? Don't worry about it. Yeah, your mom's a good lady. You know, she's a single mom. Take the check home. I was like, what? They don't do that now. They just these. I mean, obviously, it was I was being stupid, and I, yeah, I, technically, I guess like I I got a freebie on that one. But still, I mean, that guy used his common sense. Look, my my mother didn't have a lot of money. You know, he he knew she was raising two boys, single mom, because my parents were divorced. So he did the right thing. I still got punished for what I did. I mean, I got my mother whooped my rear end. But the school official used some common sense. Nowadays, it's like. Common sense, well, look, there's the toilet. Let's just dump common sense right in there. We don't even need that. What's the point of common sense? We don't know what ideas could be lurking in the mind of the child. You know what the problem is? Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook, Columbine. Some of these other, you know, the, the, the movie theater shootings, Aurora and all that. But Sandy Hook, Columbine, and the news media and all these anti-gun zealots, that's the problem. Because they have got people so scared. And people inside the government are included in the anti-gun zealotry. The, the brainwashing, the propaganda that comes out of these groups has gotten everybody so scared. And that the Sandy Hook massacre and, and the Columbine massacre have been... The, the narratives have been twisted and tweaked and things have been used to push ideas that normally anybody with a logical mind, not in fear, might look at the situation and say, hey, maybe i got to calm down, maybe i got to not be so emotional. But you see on TV a bunch of children being killed, and that's the whole side story about Sandy Hook, whether or not that, you know, it's true or not, whatever. I'm saying the point is... The, the brainwashing, the level of brainwashing that's going on out there is having somewhat of a desired effect because you have officials that are just absolutely losing their minds. Kids getting suspended from school because they bring a G.I. Joe figure in and the G.I. Joe figure has a gun. <gasps> it's got a gun. He wants to kill somebody. It's a G.I. Joe figure. Doofus. Unless you believe that imaginary plastic figures are going to come alive and start shooting people dead with 
plastic toy bullets that turn real, then I, there's really nothing to worry about. Now, if you actually believe that, then you shouldn't be teaching children or a superintendent or in charge of anything. In fact, at, you know, you send the kid for a five-hour psychological evaluation. Maybe you should be sent for a psychological evaluation. All the administrators, perhaps, should be sent for a psychological evaluation. The teacher should have realized what was going on, should have questioned the kid. Should A good teacher knows the students, knows the drama that's going on, should have known maybe there was some, some problems there, and should have said, I'm not dealing with this. You, that's a, you know, and I would have told the kid in the back, that's a really serious charge to make. You shouldn't be screwing around like that. If you say, if you, if you do this again or say something again, I'm going to send you to the office. Knock it off. No, no, no. Zero tolerance. He said gun. Oh, my God. Under the desks. Run. Kids, climb into a fetal position under your desk. Stick your thumb in your mouth and pray that somebody comes and helps you. No, that's not the good way to do anything. First of all, don't even get me started about defending yourself, but the kid didn't do anything. Or how about the kid that was chewing the Pop-Tart into the shape of a mountain and his idiot teacher perceived it to be a gun? Oh my god, a Pop-Tart gun! It's, is that even... Even if the kid was chewing it in the shape of a gun, is a Pop-Tart gun that intimidating? Really? Just saying. Just saying. Pop-Tart gun. Idiots. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Next hour and a half, we are joined by my good friend, investigative journalist, researcher, webmaster, and all-around awesome person, Stephanie Sledge. Stephanie, welcome back to the broadcast. Hi, Papa. It's a pleasure to be back on your show tonight. It's been a while, actually. Yes, ma'am. It's been too long. It has. Well, it's good to be back on the show, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. There's so much stuff I want to pick your brain about. Uh, there's a ton of it. You just wrote a, a couple new articles. Uh, the first one I, I want to actually tackle is the one that you just uh, most recently released, the one about the, sw the rise in SWAT team tactics and pretty much the militarization of our police forces here uh, in the United States. I know that you're awake and you're aware and everything, but what was the uh, what was like the tipping point for you when you realized that it's not so much, oh, it's just a few bad apples in the police force. No, there's a much larger agenda going on here. What, what was the tipping point for you? Um, well, I think it was probably just the fact that we're seeing it in our local communities. And, I mean, you know, before it just seemed like that it was happy, like, happening like in the big city areas, you know, like the urban cities and, and such. And, but now I think more and more people are starting to see the police and a lot of the SWAT team tactics going up in their local communities. And, and that does raise a lot of, you know, suspicion suspicion for citizens simply because, um, you know, it, it's almost like they're, the police are being trained nowadays that there's some kind of war that's going on in our communities that needs to be handled by militarized special operations and urban warfare tactics. Well, like you're, I mean, I knew there was a, a high rate of SWAT uh, type raids going on. I knew that there were a lot in this country. I knew that the rate was super, th you know, high and going through the roof almost. But uh, your numbers in your article kind of blew my mind. Like I've read other articles, but I, you know, you you do, especially when you're a radio show host, you go over so much information. At least me, I go through so much information in the course of one day. Sometimes, even though I read it, it just and I know it's in there, it it doesn't ping. And I was sitting there reading your article and. It, the, this one quote from it, there are more than 150 SWAT team raids every day in this country. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. What? That's a large number, Stephanie. Yeah, I. it is. It's alarming. And it's going on every day. And um, even today, there's an article that I'm going to be posting on my Mayday page, you know, hopefully in the morning. And it talks about even in Iowa... Um, small town Iowa in Nevada, Iowa, you know, the police or the sheriff's department, you know, received uh, um, some heavy duty equipment there and it's all militarized as well. And so, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable, you know, and I mean, they're taking possession of mine resistant ambush protected vehicles 
and you know they're just turning our our local communities into you know a war zone almost you know they're just training the police to be um, you know completely paranoid and a lot of these SWAT teams as well are, are being used in you know just petty drug crimes and um, you know no knock raids and it's just it's really out of control and you know people are becoming extremely paranoid of the police because of it well I can't say as I blame them I mean just looking through your article alone you have a ton of different examples in there with all the videos of police shootings and you know uh, the the marine that was shot in his home they I, I forget how many times that they they shot him they opened fire but they have the video Over where they're 60 yeah they're standing outside his house and you hear them go in and you just hear bam 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 and, and the, the guy was he didn't do anything he wasn't evil he wasn't al qaeda there was no reason to go in his house with a full on mil paramilitary unit like that and execute him it's just there's no excuse for this and the fact that people do not get pissed about this is a problem I mean, the, 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 the apologists, that go, well, it makes me feel safe. No, you're not safe. They could raid your house. What happens when reading a book becomes illegal, right? <laughs> exactly. And that's exactly what's going on. And it's happening in every, seems like every area of our government, whether it's education or, you know, just everything. I mean, just what you were talking about earlier in the segment is just, it's so out of control. And they brought, you know, the whole agenda of paranoia, um, and and we all know what the agenda is behind it. It's to disarm Americans and make everybody else so paranoid of people that have or, or own guns, and you know, it's just it's such it's so ad agenda driven. And you know, I you know I I do have respect for you know there are there are police officers you know that that are good people and they don't agree with what's going on and and I do recognize that and but there are also those that enjoy this hostile takeover from within America and it has to stop well see i understand this you what you just you just put it perfectly i understand what's going on a lot of people you know, could get mad at the cops, and I've gone into that, you know, being mad at the cops, being divided, cops versus citizens, stuff like that. But um, I see what's going on here. And uh, Joe Joseph has talked about this, a good friend of mine. He's another host here at the network. He's talked about this as well. If you can't have the troops on the streets, because it's technically, you still can't do it. I mean, they do. They're slowly doing it. But it, if you can't have the troops on the streets, let's say, say that would... That would be bad, um, you know, propaganda-wise, you know, hearts and minds-wise, and the fact that most of the troops are, let's be honest, in everybody else's backyard, so they really can't be driving around ours. What's the next best thing? And what's perfectly legal to do in accordance with the way the laws are set up right now? Well, they militarize the local police forces. So you go from having Barney Fife, who when I was a kid, I see, I remember when I was a kid, the cops wore like a professional-looking uniform that was more... It was like a cross between a suit and a uniform. It was very professional looking. They had ties, you know, tie clips. Or just the way they presented themselves, and they, they had guns and everything else, but just the way that they presented themselves was a lot more professional. I'm not saying that there weren't bad cops back then. Lord knows there were. But now it's the militarization of the police department because they can go and kick in doors and do SWAT team raids and the the same thing that our military does in Iraq or Afghanistan, same tactics, same exact tactics, same gear, same everything, except they're not military, they're police. So it's acceptable. I mean, you saw the Boston bombing. How many people were cheering when those when the military and the sheriffs and the police were driving through the towns with Humvees and MRAPs, and they all they all had fully automatic weapons pointing at people in their own houses and tell them get get in your house or get out because we're going to search your house with no warrant. And anybody that put up a fight got dragged out and arrested. But the people cheered. Come save us! Come save us! Come save us! But if it was the if it was full on Marine Corps coming down the street and special forces, there still might be more resistance because the, our brains just aren't m that mushy yet. You know what I'm saying? They're not just not there yet. We're almost ready as a country. We're almost ready for that. I mean, they they love the police coming around. I I've had this conversation about the MRAPs. 
and you, you brought up a good point with the MRAP vehicles, the mine resistant vehicles. How many people ha- do you know that you've ever had a conversation with about this where they go, well, that thing makes me feel safer? R- really? They, I like the fact that they use the terminology rescue vehicle on the side of it. I was a firefighter for six and a half years. That is not a rescue vehicle at all. Unless, of course, you're going into urban combat situations to rescue somebody. Then it's a rescue vehicle. Ah. Just this whole game, of be- it's being set up. They, they want us versus the cops. And uh, a lot of people need to realize, you, yes, you can get mad at the police for their own, their own actions. But getting mad at them and being forceful or, or, or putting yourself and them in that mindset of us versus them mentality is exactly what the powers that shouldn't be want. And it's this game of chess that they're playing, and this is part of it. We have to think beyond them, and we have to figure out a way to deal with this. And the best way to deal with it is to approach these police officers, sheriffs, and especially maybe with retired sheriffs or former sheriffs or police officers or judges or federal agents like the Oath Keepers and other organizations and try to educate them about what's really going on. They're not part of some special elite group. They think they are. They're not. They're going to get thrown away just like everybody else is. They don't care about them. So we're all on the same team. They're not on their team. They're on our team. And we have to understand that and approach them in that manner, even though a lot of times there there are law enforcement types that are just, like you said, Stephanie, they, they got that hard on to give people a beat down or shoot them or arrest them. You know, there are people like that. And it's unfortunate. That it, but the way the job is set up right now, it attracts those type of people. So... We need to reach out to them. What do you think about reaching out to the police and trying to educate them about this stuff? Well, I think it's definitely needed, and more and more people need to, you know, do that. And, you know, the I was going to bring up the sheriff, you know, and, you know, I mean, just this example that, you know, is going on in small-town Nevada, Iowa, where, you know, the sheriff receives his new vehicle, and it's 11 feet tall, and it holds 10 people, and... Um, you know, when I get my May Day page up, and, and your listeners, by the way, they can go to my website. It's called thegovernmentrag.com. And I do have a section at the top that you can click on, and it's called May Day, May Day Movement. And for about, I think, about three, year, about three years now, I've been keeping track of a lot of articles that have been coming out about the police state. And you can go there and you can see, I mean, you can scroll down month month through month and see, you know, what is happening in America. I mean, it's just unreal. It's unreal and overwhelming in a way to even scroll down through all these articles and see what is happening. And, you know, the sheriff, <laughs> it's very disappointing in this county, um, in Nevada, Iowa, that the Story County Sheriff's Office would take possession of such a vehicle. I mean, you know, it, it should be the responsibility of the sheriff, you know, to throw out all this nonsense in the in the local communities and in the county. And and this is just an example of how they're all being indoctrinated, um, given federal money to receive these. And a lot of these vehicles come from uh, their former military vehicles, and the federal government, you know, gives grants and such, and they receive them. And you know, like you said earlier, there is a tie between, you know, the whole 911 system and emergency management and such. And, you know, to be honest with you, Popeye, it's becoming a business. I mean, there's there's a lot of money uh, to be made in, you know, this type of SWAT, this, this type of, you know, the transportation charges and such. And, I mean, it really is just an indoctrination that we we need to uh, not take care of ourselves and not help each other. Um, we can't handle emergencies. You know, we can't uh, defend ourselves. You know, this this really is a hostile takeover from within. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. That's why they, like I said, they need the police to do it for them. Like I remember when I was a firefighter, and they started. They started with this, I think it's what is it, the 1033 program, I think it's called, and that they started giving away um, military vehicles. Back then it was deuce and a half. And uh, this is like 20 years ago, and our town got one of them, or maybe about 15 years ago, and uh, the town I was a firefighter in got one of them, and I was 
the, the guy who was in charge of uh, the emergency management office at the time, he was the one that had hooked it up uh, through the, the the army and you know through the the 1033 program, or if it was one of, you know if it was before that its predecessor whatever the hell it was, and he we got this deuce and a half and the, the I remember the town, like the city manager, the mayor, everybody, I mean, the fire department chiefs, everybody questioning why we had it. I was the trained driver on it because I knew how to drive it, and I was you know luckily lucky enough. Um, it was me and one other person that were only allowed to drive it, so nobody was taking it out, at least at the time, for, for joy rides and anything else. But I'm sure it's been modified. I mean, I haven't been there in a long time, so I'm sure it's been modified, and there's probably machine guns mounted to it now. All for a, a relatively small town in New Jersey. We, I mean, and back then they questioned, why do we need this stuff? And this was 15 years ago, at least. So... I just I have a different perspective on it, I guess, because I can look at this from both angles and say, well, you know, they some of those things could be used in a depending on the situation. Like I could see taking the chassis of one of those vehicles, like taking the armor box and all that stuff off, perhaps taking the chassis and turning it into like a good recovery vehicle for a tow truck. I mean, those things would make great off road uh, recovery tow trucks, especially for going in like wooded areas and stuff like that for for certain types of situations. Anybody that's a, been a tow operator would know things like that. Um, you know, again, maybe re refitting it to do something else. But the way that they're set up when they come back and they just give them, you know, the armored vehicle, I don't really think there's a need for that in Main Street America. I mean, who the hell are you going to be getting into a firefight with that you need to roll up on their house with that? And then what happens is because there really isn't a need for it, like in your article, it points out, this is one of the things that points out, all these raids, they take place with these armored vehicles. Well, they have to justify the use of the, you know, the need for a SWAT team, all the training, the vehicle. So how do they justify it? Well, they go after, what like you said, low-level offenders. And people that are, I mean, okay, like you point out in your article, one of the one of the newest cases is they were going after a guy and he had like char- like battery charges or whatever against him and he, they, he took off and was running from him. So maybe the guy's not that great of a person as an individual. But still, that doesn't give them the excuse to continuously do this. They will use the excuse of, well, this person's not a, a good individual because you know, he's got a record. Well, okay, so he was in for maybe battery and something else, whatever the hell else it was. What happens, like I said, if in the future reading a certain book can get you thrown in jail or rounded up? I mean, it's happened before in history, so why can't it happen again? Because this is America, Popeye. That would never happen, right, Stephanie? This is this is America. Exactly. That's what people believe. I mean, you know, it's for everybody's safety, and as long as we're safe, we're living in a comfortable America. And it's just, it's just unbelievable the blindness that's going on. I see it everywhere, and you know, it's just. I guess there's more work to be done. And as far as the what you were talking about earlier about the unarmed man, yeah, he. I mean, he did have outstanding warrants for child abuse, and I believe it was aggravated battery, but still, I mean, you know, I know how they present it in the AP, you know, where he's the bad guy, and but it does not give the police in this country the right to execute or be the executioner. You know, the fugitive did have a right to a jury by his peers and to determine whether he was innocent or guilty, and... You know, I know that there was a lot of backlash and fury over, you know, what happened there. And but still, I mean, there there should have been more outrage. I mean, it just to me, it's just, you know, it's just unbelievable how um, this stuff is going on. But you know, maybe it doesn't happen to one person, so they, I mean, they don't see it. But then there are others too that that you know, it's it's just a constant battle. And once people get into the system, it appears, you know, especially. Um, you know, it seems to be nowadays like these small time drug raids where they have to justify using these SWAT teams. You know, it makes no sense to me. It's just a waste of our taxpayer dollars. Most of the time, you know, uh, most of the time, you know, even if there's no drugs found at the scene, like the um, Jose, I believe his name was Jose Guevara, who he was shot 60 times over a marijuana drug raid, and they found no drugs at the scene. You know, and to me, they're just deadly and unnecessary SWAT killings, and they're they're justified by, 
using the failed drug war, and a lot of people need to wake up to that. The, the, fa the, dr the war on drugs has failed, and it's not a reason for the police to become executioners in this country and just, you know, no-knock raids and just bust doors down and treat everybody in sight as a threat. It, it's just out of control. I mean, it really is. And, like, again, the, the justification is they get these toys and all this stuff, and then they have to justify it. And here's a question I have for you, because this is a fact. The military doesn't give them the parts to, to upkeep these things. They have to purchase that themselves. So one has to wonder how much money is being made by the, the companies that made these vehicles for years to come. I mean, how much money do you think is getting made? It's just like the, the car industry. Cars aren't made to last. Uh, the, you know, newer stuff's not made to last uh, uh, like it used to. So you have to go in and get things serviced more often. You have to get you know parts replaced and stuff. It's the service industry. I mean, there's there's a whole industry based off of auto parts and every you know your car not working, your car breaking down. It has to do that, or millions of people wouldn't have jobs, and an entire industry wouldn't thrive. So if there's that much money being made off of regular, everyday, average driving, how much money do you think these defense contractors are going to be making from local municipalities that are now going to be forced to pay into this to keep funding their SWAT teams? And it's going to, it's going to come to a point where every year – there's because uh, this is how it works in small towns. I've seen it. There's budget meetings for the police, and you're, you're going to have people – this is what happens. You're going to have local activists that live in the town that are going to be smart enough to realize this, and they're going to say, well, how much money of my taxpayer dollars are being sent to Boeing or Raytheon or whoever the frig else makes any of this equipment? How much of my money, General Dynamics, how much money of my tax dollars is being sent per year to upkeep this crap for the police department to drive around in it and harass people and, and kill people and – paramilitary style SWAT raid people for petty crimes that 10 years ago you wouldn't have needed this for. This is just to justify this constant existence of this. I mean, somebody's going to eventually realize this and they're eventually they're going to have to realize how much money. The question is how many years is this going to go on before people enough people start to question it and then maybe it gets reversed. I know there was a bill uh, being talked about where they, uh, uh, they wanted there was at least a one congressman, I think it was a congressman, um, congressman or senator, one of the two, 50-50 shop, I will say congressman, he was throwing around a bill, and I think they shelved it probably till next year, of course, uh, that they were going to stop giving local police departments MRAPs and all this other armored vehicles. They could still give them microwaves and desks and stuff like that, but you couldn't get anything bigger than a, a basically a, a passenger vehicle. So if you wanted to get like a pickup truck or something, but you you can't get... um. You can't get like a, an up armored Humvee or an MRAP or something else. They, you know, they, the, this guy realized what was going on. He said, "This is ridiculous. We don't need to be militarizing the, the streets." But I just wonder. I, I just wonder how much money these defense contractors are going to make. I mean, it, it's like if, if you think about it, they're going to be the Napa Auto Parts of all these police stations. You know, if we'll we'll say, and I don't, I don't know, I can't remember right now off the top of my head who makes the MRAPs, but let's say it's General Dynamics. Uh, and that, and that might actually be accurate too, but we'll say say it's General Dynamics, right? Well, how much money do you think General Dynamics is going to make? Because it's not like you can go to other competition and buy aftermarket parts. You can't go online and well, I'll just screw them. I'm not going to the dealership. I'll buy aftermarket parts and do it myself. I'm a mechanic. Yeah, well. The towns would love to do that. They have their own mechanics who are probably being trained on how to work on this thing. And what, that's another thing. What happens if they don't? Well, they don't have mechanics that know how to operate it and, and fix it. Where do they go to learn? Oh, they got to go to the defense contractor who built it to take courses to learn on how to maintain it. That's how they train the military when something new comes out. They send the mechanics and whoever's working on the engineers over to schools. Sometimes in other countries, they're gonna have to do the same thing with local mechanics. Who's gonna pay for that? I'm sure the I'm sure the contractors aren't going to give that for cheap. That's going to be where they make their bread and butter. Parts, labor, teaching. Mm. So how much money do you think is going to be spent on this? A ton, I tell you. I mean, think about it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I I mean, it, it really has become a business and anything that um, you know, can be 
done in the local communities now to beef up the police state, it just seems like that, you know, there is agendas and, and money trickling down to keep other, you know, too big to fail companies or bailout companies in business. And I think what you meant earlier was, you know, our money flowing to China because, you know, it it really is, you know, it's just insanity and you do bring up, you know, really valid points about the money situation and who's going to pay for that. Well, you know, if the citizens, you know, can't pay for it, which, you know, I mean, pretty much we're all slaves right now anyway, but, you know, then they go to the federal government and they find these grants and in order to, you know, receive a lot of these grants, they have to go through, you know, there, there's a process of procedures and such and, you know, sometimes that involves signing up for tyrannical agenda and they go along with it and we've seen that anyway with just, uh, you know, like false flag drills and and such just to keep, you know, I mean, it really is. There's a lot of training that's involved in, in having these grants and, um, you know, I mean, how can the citizens pay for it? You know, in local communities, it would be interesting to do some research to find out how, what are the percentages of people, you know, being thrown in the system and how much money is flowing, you know, to fund all this entire police state operation and I know there's other other investigative journalists that have uncovered a lot of the money issues with all this but it's not just I mean we're just talking about one aspect of the SWATs I mean there's several aspects of SWATs it seems like every area of government is getting them I mean they, they've had EPA um, SWAT raids you know where they go and raid farmers that have raw milk and you know we're seeing it you know with the land bureau management you know even in the recent story that's going on about um, let's see the Nevada case where the farmers were trying to take pictures of their own farm on private property and I'm sure you've heard about this and you know basically that's just trampling the whole situation is trampling all over the First Amendment and I'm going to be including that in my May Day article that I'm going to put out in the morning and talk about the agenda behind what's going on out there in Nevada right now. But I mean, they're basically federal snipers with the Bureau of Land Management, and you know, they're they have guns on members of the family. I believe it was yesterday, and it, because they had stopped to take pictures of cattle outside the bounds of the supposedly First Amendment area. And so, you know, I'm going to address that too. I mean, there's a lot going on and a lot of SWAT teams being put together. It's not yes, just police departments. Yeah. It seems to be going up everywhere, including... No, you're right. Like, every federal agency is getting a SWAT team now. It's exactly. just it's utterly ridiculous. The janitorial staff has their own SWAT team at this point. I'm going to cut us off because the top of the hour break is sneaking up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. Stephanie and I will be right back in three short minutes. Go check her website out, The Government Rag. Com. We will be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from FederalJack.com. Tonight, I am joined by my good friend, investigative researcher, author, and webmaster, Stephanie Sledge. You can check out all of her work over at The Government Rag. And before we even get into it, Stephanie, I want you to give yourself shameless plugs for your Twitter, Facebook, anything else, and plug Apple Zebra 11 really quick. Okay. <laughs> well, you can, uh, like I said, you can go to my website. It's called The Government Rag, and it's R A G, thegovernmentrag.com. And um, there you can find daily news and headlines that I post and then also um, some investigative reports that we have contributing writers that you can read their work and um, my Twitter is it's just government rag so you can go to Twitter and type in government rag and then also on Facebook you can find me at, at gov rag so Facebook gov rag and um, as far as Apple Zebra 11, yes, you can um, go to my website, and at the top, um, you can click on Investigations, and you can click on a link where you can order my report that I put out called Apple Zebra 11, and it's all about the Jerry Lee Loeffner cover-up. And um, you know, basically, 
you know, you can read all about all the cover-ups that I found uh, when I investigated the Jerry Lee Lochner shooting that happened in Tucson at the Safeway store. Um, a federal judge was killed, and at the time, Congress, she was a congresswoman, um, having a congresswoman on the corner event and where it happened, and she was also shot but recovered. And there, there were other several people that were allegedly killed at that site, but I went there and investigated, and I wrote a report about my findings and, you know, just the whole cover-up. So that's about that. Yes, excellent, excellent piece. I urge everybody to actually investigate it. And it's actually something that we're going to be getting into. Uh, well, something relating to that uh, in a few minutes, actually, because I want to pick your brain about the, the gun control agenda and uh, you know the whole brainwashing of how people think about guns. And that could also lead to the, the topic of a constitutional convention because now uh, they're really pushing it state by state to get enough states to vote for a constitutional convention so that they can have it. You see, people always say, well, we need a new amendment for this or a new amendment for that. But once you open a constitutional convention, the entire thing can be changed, including the original 10. That's the problem. And if you get enough people brainwashed into being afraid of guns, they could say, well, that's old. We don't need that. Get rid of the Second Amendment. And if they abolish the Second Amendment and enough states actually vote for it, that's a huge problem. That's a big problem. I mean, not that, they, not that everybody would go and readily turn their guns in, but that means that there's going to be some trouble brewing. So uh, it, you know, that, we'll get into that. Anyway, I, I want to continue on the, the police state for a second because there's, a, there's just another case that you know, I want to get your, your take on, Stephanie, see if you've even heard about this. Um, over on policestateusa.com, they, they have a, those guys post a lot of good articles like exposing the police state. And uh, they post an article about a woman getting raided at 5 a.m. by the DA because she was shopping for indoor gardening supplies. Did you hear about this? I did. I posted that on, under the police state. Yeah, outrageous. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's happening. It, ridiculous. For the listeners that don't know, this woman went shopping at an indoor gardening supply and beca- store, and when the DEA was watching the store, they saw her come out with a bag, which they didn't know what was in it. So that justified them, uh, in their eyes, to follow this woman and to monitor her. And be, they ended up finding stems from plants in her garbage, and they were like, oh my god, it's a stem! See, she's got, she's got the dreaded marijuana plant! Which is actually cannabis guy's marijuana slang term. Anyway... Oh my God, she's got marijuana. So they raid her house at 5 a.m. But she wasn't growing marijuana. She was, I think she was growing uh, hibiscus plants. I mean, these people can't even... How about if, if you're going to go and raid her garbage just because... First of all, what, what kind of country do we live in, Stephanie, that you're getting your, your house raided at 5 a.m. and watched based on the fact that somebody saw you buying something at a perfectly legal store? It'd be like if you went to Home Depot and the cops monitored you getting walking out with something from the garden center and said, this guy must be a drug dealer and raided your house or followed you around and went through your trash and maybe they found clippings from plants and raided your house based on that. I mean, that's the same thing that they did to this woman. She went to a perfectly legal store. She wasn't going to some shady, you know, one of them, one of them their pot places. No, she was going to a store to buy growing equipment in this case i think it was fertilizer she was buying for the hibiscus plant um so buying fertilizer justifies them investigating her i think for like 30 days they said sneaking onto her property to dig through her trash and then raiding her just absolutely insane stephanie yeah it's psychotic is what it is it's absolutely psychotic and you know all the people that are writing all these policies and procedures and one of the things that, you know, I want to take everybody back to for a second is I did write an article um, exposing a lot of how, um, you know, the, this type of stuff is going on and, it, and it's tied to a business license, getting a business license. And um, if you, there's an article that I wrote called Three Years After Tucson Shooting, Deeper Gun Confiscation Agenda Emerges. And you can find that on my bio on the website. But Anyway, back to the story, you know, basically what I do is I lay it out, you know, the, not only the gun confiscation agenda, but then I go into the fact that 
America is really, our, the businesses, you know, have to get business licenses. And a lot of times they're tied to agencies like that, like the DEA. I mean, you have to question why was the DEA there doing stings in the first place? You know, was it a requirement for them to have a business license? You know, because a lot of the business licenses are tied to having a reason for these agencies to come and, you know, do these types of stings. I mean, we see it with the ATF, um, you know, in restaurants, convenience, you know, convenience stores, anywhere that alcohol is sold or tobacco, you know, and such. So, I mean, it, what you're saying really, it makes me question, you know, why would they be there in the first place and why are they, you know, why are these types of things going on? I mean, we really become a complete paranoid nation. When I was living in South Beach, the head shops down there, which they sell pipes and stuff like that, but it's, you know, you can smoke tobacco out of them. I'm sure people smoke cannabis out of them, but you, you can smoke tobacco out of them. They don't advertise them as cannabis. And they do they do sell other stuff to, to you know, a lot of the places they have like little cigar rooms and stuff in the back and things like that. So it's it's more than just pipes. But, yes, there are pipes there and water systems or otherwise known as bongs. And um, I would see these guys get raided for like back in like we'll say like 2002 to around like 2005, 2006 even under the guise of fighting the war on terror. I'm not kidding. The DEA was raiding and and the war on drugs but because the war on drugs funds the war on terror, remember. Uh, and remember right after 9-11, remember all the commercials that smoking pot – if you smoke pot, you're supporting terrorism. Remember those? Where they were they were trying to equate smoking marijuana exactly. or excuse me smoking cannabis to supporting Bin Laden. Remember that? Yeah. And I was like, um, my cannabis doesn't come from. I remember because I, I I I was smoking back when I was younger, and I was like, um, mine comes from a guy I know that like he gets it from a local farmer. Like I know Bin Laden's not growing mine. It, it just didn't make when I was younger. I saw right through that crap. Um, it's just ridiculous. But that's what they were doing supposedly. They were they were taking pipes and bongs and stuff. You know, fighting the war on terror. How taking a, a pipe from a smoke shop, and when I say a pipe, I don't mean a pipe. They would clean them out, Steph. They would, like, come in, and if this guy, I mean, that's that's your product. The guy had to pay a glass blower. And by the way, a lot of this stuff was made by local glass blowers. Some of the, one of the actual glass blowers that did most of the work was the guy that taught me how to blow glass. A lot of people don't realize I know how to blow glass. The, and the guy that made a lot of these pipes, he did them all by hand. And I know how much money they would pay him. They would give him, a, you know, he had a contract. Every month he would deliver a certain amount of them. It took him a month to make a whole batch. I'm talking like four or 500 handmade pipes. All awesome, it, it, just beautiful, especially if you're into art. They would confiscate all of them and smash them for no reason. They would say they're fighting the war. They didn't arrest the owners. Owners never got really, really I mean, they would be under investigation. They would raid everything. They never got charged with anything, but they never got their property back either. They said it was, you know, like they couldn't have it back. It was illegal. You know what I mean? Like just that's theft. Last yeah. time I checked. Well, that's what the Forfeiture Act is for, right? To steal everything and during the raids and justify why they, you know, need to profit off of it all. It's to, that's what it's become. It's become a business, a, a, almost a cartel. I mean, I mean, it is a cartel, really. I mean, if you really want to break it down, there's a lot of corruption that goes on, and the way that they're handling the situations, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. And you know, as far as what you're saying about, you know, the the pipe shops and such, you know, raids go on there too, and stings, and it, it just, you know, it, it's really troublesome in America, especially for small business right now, to even, you know, try to keep up with anything because there's so much government involved and you know, they, they've always got to catch the bad guy, and, you know, what do they do? It's entrapment. They send people in, and they set people up, and, you know, I mean, that is entrapment, and people don't realize that, and a lot of business owners, they just go along with it because they think, you know, well, I'm doing the right thing, you know, or I want to keep my business license, you know, I mean, it, it just, there's really not enough even business people to stand up to all this crazy stuff that goes on. No, there's not. And you, I would watch these guys get steamrolled. And I mean, they would call their lawyers and stuff. But good luck getting your stuff back when they smash your pipes, uh, you know. And they're going to get away with it because they're government agents, like you said, forfeiture act. 
your, your stuff's done. You know, their forfeiture laws are, are ridiculous. Which, that's theft, I'm sorry. You know, that's just theft. Well, I mean, Steph, wouldn't you say it's theft if I came to your house and said, in the name of the war on drugs, I'm taking your house? Well, exactly. And, it, and there's profit sharing that goes on as well. And, and so, anyway, this is basically what's happening. It's an indoctrination. It, you know, they, they screen and they hire people um, for these positions that, you know, really will go along with whatever agenda if they feel like, you know, they're, there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. And so that's what we're seeing in our, our neighborhoods. You're either good or you're bad. And, you know, we're seeing the First Amendment, you know, go out the window. I mean, we've, we've seen so much of the disintegration, you know, of our Constitution and Bill of Rights that, you know, and, and a lot of people in general conversation that I have, you know, even on a daily basis, a lot of people are starting to realize that there's something wrong. But they can't quite understand it. And it's because, you know, everywhere you go, whether it's restaurants or... Whatever. I mean, there's always CNN on TV, and there's always, you know, just some propaganda that's going on, and that's why our nation is going to hell. It's because, you know, everybody's being indoctrinated, and, you know, nobody knows what's going on. They just, you know, believe what they're told on TV and what they're being taught in the school system, and, you know, it's, it really is time for people to just you know, they got to snap out of it pretty quick. This is getting really out of hand. It, it's getting really ridiculous. Well, you heard the first piece I played uh, before you came on uh, at, the, at 1030. You were listening, and you uh, heard the, the pencil gun story. I mean, that's just... Don't you think that's a little insane? I mean, we're of, like, the same generation, you and I. When you were a kid... You didn't see kids getting arrested by cops and, and or suspended or whatever for for stupid things that you see now and or pen, this kind of idiocy with the pencil gun. I mean, what what's your take on that whole lunacy? Well, one of the things that your your listeners can read about if they order my Apple Zero Eleven book is the fact that I do cover my discovery of what's happening as far as how the entire um, like the juvenile office is <laughs> connected to the schools now and the Department of Education and I break it down and you know I talk about how it's basically it, it's a setup for failure from the get-go and you know this whole example of this poor kid that was arrested you know I was trying to figure out you said it earlier but I was trying to figure out yesterday how you could twirl a pin like a gun you know for you know the way that he was doing it and why the teacher would be such a paranoid person and but that's exactly what's happening and I ran into a young girl the other day who I spoke to and talked to her a little bit and she had just had an interview at an elementary school and so I sparked a conversation with her and we talked for quite a while and I questioned her about Common Core and all that and I mean, she's newly out of college, and, you know, she's, she was really nice and everything, but she had no idea at all what I was even talking about. I mean, I had to explain to her, you know, that, you know, I know a lot of teachers, and I have, and, you know, there's a lot of teachers and, that are divided, you know, in what's happening in the school systems and how it's so closely related. Most, most schools now have, the police department has an office usually in the place in the school system as well as you know the referrals to the juvenile office you know so it's all intertwined and you know with uh, what we've seen with the rise in the mental health agenda you know I mean they want everybody labeled as with some kind of disorder whether you know it's you know I mean children talking about guns or even playing with guns now you know it's such it's such a crazy situation, you know. I mean, we've seen stories in the past where they've arrested children as young as seven years old for playing cowboys and robbers in their backyard and having, you know, fake guns. And, I mean, we grew up that way, you know. That that was the norm. Nobody got hurt. I mean, it was just part of life. And and now, you know, I mean, the, the kids are being trained at a young age. I mean, no wonder there's such a... A problem with uh, behavioral problems in school is because you know the schools are really creating a lot of the behavioral problems. It, well, it, it's 
I just want to smash my head against the wall when I try to talk to some of these people. I know what you mean, like these these people that, that you, you look at them as you're talking and you can see them. They're just turning off. Their their eyes are like oh, – they're not, they're not really rolling in the back of the head, but they should be because they're just glazing over and staring at you like a deer in headlights as you speak to them and you try to tell them this stuff. And that's uh, largely in part due to the educational system. I mean – I, they were brainwashing my generation, and that was back in the in the seventies, in the eighties, and into the early nineties. Can you imagine what they're doing now? Uh, well, yeah, I do because I have kids that went through the school system, so I know exactly what's going on. So, and well, let me need- let me ask you this: How outraged would you be if one of your kids got in trouble for twirling a pencil? Like, if your kid was put in this, the exact same situation that this young man was put in, how would you react? I mean, would you be furious? I, I would definitely go confront the superintendent or principal or whatever and I mean I would speak my mind definitely and I would you know I, I just don't understand it and these the, the parents should be outraged I mean you know there shouldn't be this type of paranoia in school I mean what do, what do we send our kids to school for well it, to indoctrinate apparently and you know the school systems I you know I, I think if I could do it all over again I definitely would have homeschooled all my kids and you know it would have been it would have been so much better for them and you know but they also grew up in an atmosphere where you know I try to undo everything they learned so you know it just I guess it just depends but as far as the behavioral problems you know a lot of times kids are just kids and you know so what if they twirl a pencil in school or you know eat a peanut butter sandwich that looks like a gun. I mean, it's, it, it's just paranoia on the teachers and the educational system and the higher educational system where they're training, um, you know, the teachers and all these people in administrative positions in the educational system to be paranoid. And so you have to really look back again at the financial part, you know, where is the paranoia coming from? Is it grants that they're receiving from the Department of Education? You know, are these grants tied to, um, you know, that they have to have a certain amount of safety? And that safety would include um, the police department in the school having an office and a link to the juvenile office and a link to the mental health center. So, you see, it's all a business, and they all have to be incorporated now in the educational system. It's insurance reasons. Yeah, well, you know, the educational system is like a uh, a factory, and your children, everybody's children, are uh, uh, nothing more than a product, and that's well, well, Common Core. I've talked about this before. Common Core is the they're not it's not really curriculum; it's standards, and it's just standards of what they want now. And if, if things go, uh, you know, the way they're it, like, say, no one interferes, and the, it goes the way the powers that shouldn't be want it to. In five years, the standards that they want would change because the people would be much dumber and it would be much easier and they would have figured out ways to expedite the process. And, and, and you know, they're doing just like what they would do uh, with, your, with, a, with the, the nation's children, uh, like they would do if they were manufacturing a product. First, they, they, they set it up to manufacture the product, which is what schools have been turned into, and now they're taking that factory – and over the with Common Core, the these standards, and as I said, they you know I've talked to Charlotte Isserby about this. They're going to change over the course of time. They, <clears throat> as these these standards change, um, you know, Common Core is, is more so just the what they need now. And as it changes over the course of time, and it, it modifies, um, just like you would with a factory. Maybe you start off with an older piece of equipment. And it's a little bit bulky. It's thirty years old, older technology. There's newer stuff, but hey, that's what the, the you know what, what the factory had. But now you're, you're running the place for six months. Well, let's let's make it more modernized. Let's let's make it more efficient. We've got the funding to do so. We've got people like Bill Gates throwing money at it. So if they have the funding, they they make it more efficient. So over the course of time, that's what if if it goes uninterrupted, that's what you'll see. Good thing about that whole mess, though, is people are really starting to wake up about this, Stephanie. Parents are starting to see what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And it's good that they are. And like I said, I, I've talked to a lot of teachers, you know, especially in the last five, ten years. And, you know, there's there's quite a few teachers that are really, they don't like, they used to love teaching. 
and you know they did it for a reason and now it just seems like that they themselves are you know the factory there as well and it, it's in higher education now too like you said and it really is I mean you know it, a lot of students come out of school and they believe all this stuff and you know you can tie it into just the complete paranoia of everybody's you know everybody needs to be paranoid of everybody else and if you do something that's out of the norm then you might have a mental disorder and you know just the whole situation I don't know parents need to wake up and probably the only way to deal with this is to just take the kids out of the schools and let it fail well you know I say homeschool I mean, I mean the schools are completely uh, all of them at this point are completely tainted I mean then we know the public school systems messed up and we know that the uh, you know these these private schools, to a certain degree, uh, actually the, the, most of them because they they have to a lot of them get grant money here or there from the federal government or in, in some way shape or form something from the government. So then you have to nothing from the government's ever free. You always have to adhere to their standards. So they you know once 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 they do that you know Charlotte said this before that you know the, they're in the door the foot's in the door it's done. So private schools, charter schools, no good. Charlotte's explained why that. We've got, you know, I've gone over that with her. So all these schools are right now. It's the the whole school system as a whole. Even Catholic schools are being corrupted with their Catholic school version of Common Core. I, I, I kid you not. So yeah. Speaking of, I mean, and it is crazy. And just speaking of that, I want to, you know, make an announcement that on the top story, as the world turns on the government rag, you know, that one of the things that was shocking today was you know, as far as, you know, the whole Catholic schools and and all the way the trickling down was that the, the bishops had passed a rule that child molestation does not have to be reported now. So, I mean, that's startling. So, I mean, there's corruption everywhere, and the school systems are definitely, uh, they need to be seriously looked at by parents and put under a microscope, and, you know, these people that are in in positions of, <clears throat> quote, authority, they need to be, you know, thrown out and replaced with, uh, you know, people that will not, you know, take these federal grants and have all these ties. And, I mean, if we want our school systems to work, you know, we need to get the government out of them as far as, you know, like all this federal um, stuff. And But I think really the main thing is, is people should, they should homeschool now. It really, it, it's the only way I think that the, the school system it has to fail. I mean, it's it's so far beyond now. And, you know, teachers, homeschooling, there's all kinds of communities that have homeschooling um, schools, you know, and so it's not like you, you have to just rely on homeschooling at home. There's many communities that have homeschools and, you know, where there's quite a few, you know, students that go to them. So, I mean, that really is the way people are have to take responsibility again and get back to taking care of the education with their kids and not just let send their kids to school and expect that they're going to become superstars when they come out because there's too many kids are overwhelmed with school you know I know many teenagers many many teenagers I've talked to you know and I've listened to them and I understand I mean it is so overwhelming to even go to school nowadays and you know, just the idea of being watched. I mean, all the schools are being set up where there's cameras in every hallway. And, you know, there's just complete paranoia everywhere. And, I mean, I don't blame the teenagers for having, you know, a hard time and having behavioral problems because sometimes it's just so overwhelming to be accused of things that they're not really doing. They're just kids reacting to... Uh, their environment. Trust me, I understand that real well. I, I was you know, labeled a troubled child myself. I'm going to cut us off because the break is sneaking up on us. The other side of the break, I want to get Stephanie's take on the brainwashing for the gun control agenda and a few other things. Do not go anywhere. Check her website out, thegovernmentrag.com. We will be right back. We are back. Final segment, ladies and gentlemen. I want to get right back into it because we only have a, about 25 minutes left. That's just never enough time with Stephanie. Steph, the idea that the powers that shouldn't be would put out propaganda, mind control type information or just blatant mind control with programming the masses against guns. The, the idea 
that they would do that. Some some might think, oh, that's just crazy. That's just conspiracy theory. Yet you you look at what's going on, and you you include it in with uh, Eric Holder's statement from the '90s about they have to change the way people think about guns. They have to brainwash people into thinking differently. Literally, that's what he said. You can go look it up on YouTube. I, I see different stories constantly being thrown out and thrown out in the news. Uh, you, you ever notice somebody shoots themselves in the foot and it's on CNN, ABC, NBC, you know, uh, MSNBC, Fox News, even Fox will cover things. You know, they might come in defense of it, but th- they still pick up stuff too. And there, and these news agencies are all over it. I mean, like I said, someone could actually shoot their own toe off, and it's a huge story. Oh, my God, shooting, 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 shooting. Someone was killed. And if it is something really tragic, like where a kid is killed or something, uh, in a case where maybe an idiot parent left their gun out, and they shouldn't have, and, again, that's on that parent, case-by-case basis. You can't umbrella policy everything and make it stop because it doesn't work like that. They they focus on the, the tragedies and stuff, and it's constantly, oh, my God, this poor little kid was killed. We got to get rid of guns. And, again, they're trying to change people's mind and how they think about guns and that could go like i said you know, constitutional convention oh my god get rid of guns in the second amendment but back to the propaganda back to the brainwashing and mind control i was telling you during the break what i saw while we were chatting on fox news archie andrews the comic book icon it's been around for like 73 years you know archie the comic book character ladies and gentlemen well they have a a future series, you know, comic books, they always have like spinoffs and different timelines and stuff. Well, they're doing future Archie. And do you know how Archie dies? Archie Andrews, comic book icon? He's killed by a gunman. That's right. The beloved Archie character is killed by an evil gun wielding maniac. And they, they, the article doesn't go into detail about how they, you know, what, what happens, but, you know, whether it's a robbery or a mass shooting or whatever, but he's killed by a gunman. Steph, propaganda level 10, I would say? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely off the chart. And it's happening all over, and you hit it on the nail. It's because people are watching mainstream media, you know, and all they're covering is. You know, it's just, they're just covering the shootings, but they make such a, I mean, if there's one shooting, like you said, then they cover it for hours and hours and hours, and I mean, that is mind control. I mean, it's mind control when you open up your newspaper, and it's all about, you know, just ridiculous crimes, but yet, you know, they they mention nothing about um, Jose Rivera getting shot 60 times in a drug raid where there was no marijuana found in front of his four-year-old son. I mean, you know, they're not covering the news, and that's exactly what's going on, especially with mind control of gun confiscation. I mean, there's so many things that can be tied to gun confiscation, you know, and it has to be, um, it's all about, you know, more regulations and rules, and, you know, they, they want everybody in the system, they want to know who owns the guns and who doesn't, who has, you know, who's good, who's the bad guy, you know, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a system where, you know, first they're processing as many people they can in the police state, you know, everybody gets charged, not everybody, but I'm just saying that generally people get charged with the highest charges first, which are, you know, felonies, and, you know, if they don't fight it, then they take a deal and, you know, they get put into a system and therefore they can't own any guns. And, you know, we're seeing it with mental health, you know, that there's so many states that are buying into the propaganda with marijuana, with medical marijuana, and, you know, I know that there's medical value to marijuana, but do we need to have, you know, the government regulate it? Because when you, when you regulate it, then the, there's going to be more corruption that follows and such, and so we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this really what we want? Because if we tie together the mental health agenda and the medical establishment, then there's another avenue for people to be put into a system where um, they're labeled with a mental illness of some sort or some type of behavioral problem that might prevent them, which will prevent them in the future from owning any guns. So it's a divide in the nation with the paranoid government, you know, who's the good guys, who's the bad guys, and it's, it's a hostile, it's, it's a hostile takeover of our Second Amendment. Oh, I totally agree. They're they're brainwashing people. I mean, it's evident what they're doing. Anybody with half a 
you know, half a brain cell operating uh, that knows what, even the slightest amount of what's going on or understands basic propaganda can see, that, like you said, you know, when they're, they're repeating the same thing over and over and over again, that's, that's mind control. That's brainwashing. That's how they do it. It's repetition. They keep telling you the same crap. It doesn't always have to be a lie. It could be the truth. They just want to scare the crap out of you, right? Well, exactly. And just what came to my mind real quick was that recently, you know, it had been exposed how the ATF and other agencies entrap the mentally ill and how they arrest them. And so, like, they're even using other agencies, you know, that, you know, whether they provide them with a list, I'm not sure, how they get the names of the people that are mentally ill and use them in plots and stings, you know, and it just, the whole gun confiscation um, agenda is it's really being hit extremely hard right now. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of people that are, or a lot of states that are fighting back. I know Missouri just passed um, their law, and what they did was they nullified uh, pretty much every federal gun control measure that was on the books. So, you know, they said, we've had enough. But then there are states, I believe, like, let's say Connecticut, you know, they they're so mind controlled over there that two things are happening. One, the citizens are, you know, there's not enough citizens. I know that there are, there are, the gun owners are standing up and they're refusing to register their firearms and such, but in the same respect, you know, there there's also many, many of them that we've seen right after the Sandy Hook shooting that just went and turned all their guns in because the government told them so. And so, you know, it, there's a mind control issue there as well as, uh, you know, Connecticut also. Um, there were counties in Connecticut that also voted to uh, get rid of their sheriffs, and those were replaced with police departments. And so, I mean, how does that happen? You know, well, it has to be mind control. It has to be. I mean, it, and it, the mind control starts, you know, when, you know, it's actually, it, what parents need to actually just, they, they need to teach their kids what their Bill of Rights are in the Constitution because they're not being taught that in school. I know when I was in school, um, you know, when I was in like junior high school, you know, we were taught the Constitution and Bill of Rights, you know, and it was, you know, you just, you learn them and, you know, just, you start to see them as part of your life and such. But, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, they, they don't teach that in the school system now. And also in college, I had a confrontation with my, one of my government teachers, you know, over the fact that the whole semester, you know, not once did he, you know, even tell anybody to read the Bill of Rights. And so, I mean, that's what's happening. People don't know their rights, so they just go along with whatever it is that the government wants them to do to keep them safe from the lone gunman. Well, I have to give credit to like my history teacher. I, I got a, it was in I think she was our freshman and sophomore year. Oh no, my, my freshman year. I think she was. I think yeah, sophomore and junior year, because my freshman year the guy was a drunk. But um, my sophomore and junior year, I had a history teacher named, if I remember her correctly, her name was Mrs. Gray, and she's probably dead now because when I was fourteen, fifteen years old, she was in her sixties. So she's got to be dead by now. Uh, I, I would be surprised if she's still alive. She wasn't in the greatest of health back then. She was in her, like, her late 60s, early 70s back then. So I, I would assume uh, that you know, probably 20, you know, 20 some odd years on, she's, uh, she's passed on. But um, thanks to her, you know, there's a lot of generations of kids that at least at that time that went through the school that did learn about the Constitution. Because I remember, and it's weird that you that, you know you brought this up, you know, synchronistic, I guess. But there's a lot of times when I'm on air and I'll be talking about, you know, history or something or like when I have Charlotte Ezra be on and I'll be playing uh, – because I always do the interviews with her off air. So I'll be playing the interview on air, you know, and I'll be listening to it or I'll be, you know, doing the commentary before I play the interview. And Mrs. Gray's history class pops into my head all the time. It's it's really odd how my brain works, but I'll I'll remember. I'll have – as I'm talking to everybody – while I'm live on air, and people, obviously, you guys can't tell. My, like I said, my brain works about a thousand miles an hour, but it goes off in the weird directions too. But it, uh, it, it, it's funny because as I'll be talking about history or something, I have flashbacks to her class, and I remember her talking about all of this stuff to us. 
and I don't want to call her a truther because obviously that I, I, I hate those stupid labels anyway. That's the, all those labels are made up just to to marginalize people. That's the, the goal of those things. But I mean, if you want to, I guess label or something. I guess you could say she was a good educator. She was a real teacher. I mean, she taught us real stuff. I remember we had tests about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and if we failed them, I mean, if we didn't get them right, we failed. Like, we had, we, we, we had exactly. to learn this stuff. You know what I mean? That's the way it was. I mean, when you were a kid, did you have a history teacher like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the way school was. You just, uh, you either, you, you studied and you passed or, you, you know, you failed. And that was the way it was, too. If we didn't know our Bill of Rights, we did fail. And I remember that as well. I had a teacher exactly like that. Yeah, she was hardcore. I mean, she taught us about everything. She taught us, she went over the Civil War. I remember her teaching everything. Even even to the Kennedy assassination. She didn't get into the conspiracy aspect of it, but she did say, you know, she did teach that at least he was assassinated by a gunman, blah, 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 blah. Nowadays, I talked to a girl about five or six years ago at the time she just graduated, and um, and I, I spoke to a few other people, and they had confirmed this, at least at the, the, I, the local high school down there anyway. Uh, I talked to a couple of the other graduates. She had said that they, she had heard me say, um, she was a hostess at the, the local restaurant that we used to go to after we would do like DVD handouts and stuff. And all the staff knew us, so they would come over and hang out by us. We'd give them DVDs and talk about conspiracies and stuff. And um, it was slow, so she was hanging out listening to what we were talking about. And she, she said to me, wait a minute, President Kennedy, was, she, she had heard of him, but she said he was shot and killed? I didn't know that. And she was genuine. like She wasn't being a smartass. And, and I just oh, looked fine. at her and I was like, you didn't know that? She said, no, they told us that he died in office. And that was it. And I was like, they, they left out the metal projectile that hit him in the forehead? They, that's kind of a large part of why he died, amongst the other gunshot wounds that he received. I mean, do, did, have you ever run into anybody that, that, that has said things like that to you? Oh, the, I've never heard of the Bill of Rights or something insane like that to you that is like just common knowledge to you? Well, I've I've noticed people don't know their their bill of rights. I mean, that's the the month people think they do, but and then they discount it. Like what I run into a lot is people discount the bill of rights. They they justify why you know our rights are being trampled on, and it's they usually come back with some ridiculous thing that has to be tied into some safety. And yeah, you know, I mean that's what these false flags are about. You know, it, it is about to to scare, you know, look at, look at what happened with the Boston bombing. I mean, you know, it was, it was weeks of coverage and it was all, and everybody was glued to, you know, just the mainstream media coverage. And of course the alternative media was, you know, working behind the scenes to try to get the real truth out. But I mean, it's so true. There's just so much going on that, you know, people don't really, they're, they're afraid. They see what, what's going on. And you know, they, they believe the story and they justify in their minds why, you know, we have to get rid of this, you know, Bill of Rights because of this Boston bombing or this shooting. Um, and so that's why, because people can't see past the, you know, the delusion. Like there, there's so many people that are in like a state of delusional suspended animation or something. I mean, they're just literally walking zombies. And You're right. Boston's strong. I was thinking about the Boston Marathon like five minutes ago when we were talking about it. Uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, events or propaganda, you know, things used to control people. You say, go to Boston and say that one of the locals there that buys into it, hey, I think something didn't go down the way it did. And they'll be like, how dare you? People died here. Boston's strong. Blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of locals that don't buy into it. Uh, but, I mean... It, again, it's the emotional programming. People, people were okay. They were cheering. There were, in some cases, there were people cheering. Not, not thousands and thousands of them, but there was enough that it was disturbing. Okay, uh, cheering the cops and and you know the the military riding around with their guns drawn on everybody. It, it's insane. Exactly. And one of the things I want to point out too is if uh, your listeners do go and read the article, it's on the top. It's top headlines at thegovernmentreg.com and. The article is called Elite SWAT Teams and the Discovery of the Hostile Takeover from Within. And if at the bottom of that article, I did include a, um, a graphic that I did that is about the Boston bombing and all of the martial law. And it does show those pictures exactly that you're talking about where people are cheering and they're holding the flags and they're so happy that, you know, the, 
the military police, you know, the paramilitary police arrived and it just, it's sickening is what it is, Popeye. It's just pure sickening. Yeah, it is. It's really disturbing to see people just cheering like, woohoo, martial law, bring it on. I was like, oh, oh, oh. And I know it's fear. It's fear based. I, I get it. I mean, well, it was a Hollywood show, is what it was. It oh, was that a, whole thing. Yeah, well, I mean, it was performed so that the people that are the zombies can be programmed that, you know, this is really going on. Well, that first explosion, like, <clears throat> just to point this out really quick, just so people understand why I, I think there's some shadiness going on with that whole thing. I mean, that first explosion that happened, if you look at it, there was a, a huge uh, scaffolding next to it. And when that bomb goes off, the scaffolding barely moves. You would think if terrorists wanted to cause maximum damage and kill you know, the maximum amount of people, uh, they would have put a more powerful bomb that didn't look like a Hollywood prop going off. Just saying. I mean, you can go look at the footage I'm talking about. The first bomb that goes off and then everybody slows down and then the second one went off. The second one was more powerful. But the first one almost looked like a, a prop bomb. Uh, I mean, there, and there's different reasons that I could I would say that, but even the official story doesn't say that. The official story acts like it was like some horrific, huge, you know, blast. And if you look at the footage, it wasn't. So there's just there's a lot of chicanery going on there. And then you have people again, the the the, the sickening of the the sickening sight of the people in the streets. When I saw that stuff at first, I was like, is that staged? Is that government like? And I was like, "There's only got to be like four or five people there." And yeah, there were creative camera angles, but there was a couple hundred people at least that were out there that were cheering. And that's what I meant by that's disturbing. That's still a large enough amount of people that are like, "Really, you're that into woohoo? Bring on martial law!" I mean, didn't I? I know that bothered me. It had to have bothered you when you saw that. Well, yeah, it definitely bothered me, and I, I you know, wrote an article um, called 333 Disarray, and it's all about my thoughts and little investigation that I did into that following. And But it all ties together, Popeye, all ties together to for the push to disarm Americans. You know, whether um, it's labeling the gun o- owners as mentally ill or, you know, continuing the failed drug war. You know, and it, it, it's such a hypocrisy, too, because, you know, Americans are finding out that government themselves have been caught, you know, shipping drugs in and putting them on the streets. And this exactly ties into these stings, you know, and, and training and, you know, but it seems to be like live drills where, you know, of course, the media is involved because in order to keep their license, you know, I mean, everybody has to be involved in things like that. Now, does everybody know that it's live? No, they don't. I mean... That's the whole point of having live drills is to uh, do testing and taking statistics and, you know, such. So it, 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 not everybody that's involved knows what's going on. But, you know, I think that with what's happened in the last three, three or four years just with, you know, a lot of the alleged false flag shootings and such, I mean, the information is getting out now. And, you know, that's why there's been a... A step up, you know, to create a lot of this fear and put it into propaganda on TV and, I mean, even in reality shows and all kinds of stuff, it's just everywhere. I mean, everywhere you look, you can look in magazines, you can look in, you know, you can go to work and see it, you can, you know, just everywhere you go, you can see the propaganda behind all of this. And it is a deeper gun confiscation plot and it, it ties in with mental illness just with the Boston bombing and the suspects there, you know, and 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 whatnot. But there's definitely, you know, as far as like the ATF and such, I mean, like I said, they've recently been exposed on how they entrap the mentally ill and so it's like everything that we see right now we have to question whether it's real. Oh, I, I agree. And yes, the, the, the mental illness, that's a huge aspect of the gun control agenda. That now it's, you know, the stigmatization of vets with PTSD. And, and it should be called PTS, not PTSD, because it's not a frigging disorder. Post-traumatic stress, the, the best way for, and I'm going to do an actual show uh, more in-depth where I'm, I'm going to, I have to get myself in the mood to do this because I'm going to, I want to get a little personal with you all and let you understand uh, at what PTS really is and, you know, how anybody can suffer it. But um, and I'll, I'll get into that. You know, I'll have to do that. That's a separate time. I have to get my brain in the mood for that, and that's going to take like two hours. It's just me going into it. But 
PTS can be suffered by anybody. I mean, a woman being raped, somebody being in a car accident, those are all traumatic things, and that can cause post-traumatic stress. The easiest, quick way to just explain it to you is post-traumatic stress is p- pretty much being out of sync. Picture you being out of sync with your physical self, your nervous system, okay, because that, that controls everything, your nervous system, just, you're literally out of touch with your nervous system, your physical self, and your soul, your essence, your being, okay, and you're, you're kind of scattered. And with those three kind of broken apart and not together, you're out of tune. It's just like you're, it, it's, it's not even broken apart. It's almost like you're just, instead of everything flowing perfectly and creating a beautiful beat or a beautiful harmony like you would hear in an audio editor or if you're a musician, something is out of tune. The strings just aren't right. And all it takes is figuring out how to get yourself back in tune, okay? And any type of event can cause that. But what they want to do is they want to stigmatize that. And if you're labeled with PTS, oh, my God, you're a danger to society or anything else. It's ridiculous. And not every soldier has it. Not every Marine has it. Not every sailor or airman has it. But, yes, many do for many different reasons. They don't just have to have been in combat to suffer from it, okay? Exactly. And also, too, you know, even with this recent shooting at Fort Hood, you know, I mean, you know, if it's true that he was on uh, pharmaceuticals and such, you know, and I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, vets that come back and they they put him on pharmaceutical drugs and, you know, it's just, uh, it's another way to disarm. And that was one of the major agendas anyway um, that's been going on for since the Brady Bill is disarming vets and so what better way to do it is to bring them back I mean some of these vets they weren't even in combat situations they were just you know driving a truck or something but you know they get labeled as as having this PTSD that you're talking about and they put them on medications and then you know from there they become unstable and then when something like this happens it you know allegedly then you know it's just for, you know, even more gun confiscation. So they've really targeted the vets, and it was real manipulative, too, because the agenda's been going on for years. And, and look, you know, just since Desert Storm, which, you know, has been like 23 or 24 years since the beginning of that, that, I mean, the agenda's been going on. And look at how many vets are in the system for mental illness and how many vets are not able to even own a gun and and you know I know people justify well you know they they shouldn't own a gun you know they might be dangerous well not all vets are dangerous you know I mean you take you take one and something like this happens then every vet gets looked at like they might go off you know like a crazy person and start shooting everybody and so there again it's just more agenda for people to be scared of even our vets no, agreed. A hundred percent correct. Uh, totally agreed. And it's it's the same way. Like people don't understand. Again, you could res- you could suffer post traumatic stress from anything uh, that's traumatic to you. It's really to the individual. So the pe- the people that run things, the powers that shouldn't be, and a lot of the bureaucrats don't they they don't really understand it, but they know that it can be used to their benefit to push their agenda. But don't be fooled. I mean, like, I, I've had people tell me, well, you know, my son's a vet and, you know, he's, he's, he's gone through some problems and, you know, he, he doesn't have a, he has an issue listening to the VA staff. And I, I said to them, well, you know, I, I can understand, you, you know, what he's going through. I understand he, he doesn't, he feels disconnected from everybody around him. He feels disconnected from himself. I said, and the VA doesn't help you. You go to them for help because they promise, oh, we'll take care of you. And you go for them that, for help and they treat you like a prisoner. And they just want to pump you up on all sorts of pharmaceutical medications, which don't make you feel any better. They actually make it worse in a lot of cases. Well, and you're right. You know, like uh, piecing back the body and the mind and the spirit has to be done from within. And, you know, I know that there are people that do require to have, you know, I mean, there are actually people that do require some of the mental illness drugs, you know. And, but a lot of them don't. Like, it's just a quick fix to make someone feel better. And, you know, it, it ends up just ruining their lives because people can't get off of them. And I've seen it happen to so many people. And, unfortunately, people that are really close to me as well. And so, you know, that's, that's the problem right there is that we're, you know, we're, we live in a society that is indoctrinating everybody that if you have this problem or feel this way or feel that way, then you're mentally ill. And 
really in reality, these feelings are human. I mean, we have to have them, we have to feel them, and we have to, that's how you piece yourself back together. You have to go through them. And so, you know, by drugging yourself and, you know, covering it all up, it's just a reason to keep, you know, keep in, in that state of mind. It's just... Oh well, yeah, it keeps people in a controllable state of mind, and uh, you know, it's it's horrific. I, I'm not like I said, I'm gonna have to do a whole show on uh, PTS, and I'll, I'll get into it even in more detail for the listeners. But I'm gonna cut us off because we're out of time, Stephanie. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Yeah, thank you. I had a really good time, and I'll look forward to our next visit. I do too. Uh, it's it was fun as always, and it went by way too quick. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out. Stephanie's website, thegovernmentrag.com. I go check it out for news articles, so should you. I'll see you all again live tomorrow night. Remember, the solutions to our problems are an inside job. I love you all. 